Hello, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Great to have you here with us today. If you've come via YouTube and want to know more about what we do, it's really simple. Head on over to officehours.global. That's kind of our primary web portal for more information and links about the show. Uh, remember, this show is entirely driven by your questions. And the simplest way to do that is to head over to the URL askofficehours.global. And once you're there, it's a really simple interface. That's what it looks like. And it just gives you a chance to pop questions into the show really easily and really Really simply, and then our show is driven by your questions and the votes on them. So, check that out if you want to ask questions and contribute to what we do here. Um, other than that, our second hour today is Rundown Studio. We're very excited. John Barker, our old friend, is going to be here to talk about the new tool for managing live events. So if you work in live, you're really going to want to stick around and hear what John has to say about that. Uh, you hear us use the term run a show a lot. It's important if you're doing live stuff, and that's our talk topic in the second hour today. But this is the first hour. So, Mitch, what questions do you have in our virtual hopper for today? Virtual hopper. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Douglas Carmichael's in with a question with Andy spearheading a workaround for the ATEM Crush in the Zoom client. Do you think we'll see a general Mac OS filter tool to implement this fix for other apps? Alex is going to start us off today. Alex, what do you think? Yeah, uh, I, I think that what they're doing is far more complicated than, than just doing a filter. They're not just fixing the problem. They are working directly with the switcher. Uh, what they're doing is really hard. Um, and it is, um, it's complex. And I don't think that, uh, I don't know if other, the other platforms are even paying attention to what they're doing. I mean, it, it really is a, is a nod to how detail oriented the Zoom team is about, you know, the video quality that we have. Um, so yeah, it's, this is not something that is just adding a filter. It's not just adjusting what shows up. It's actually making the correct requests and so on and so forth, I believe, um, to the switcher itself. So it's, it, this is a pretty, pretty complex. The only, the only one, the only company that can fix this system wide is black magic. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> so maybe, maybe they can, they can do that. So, um, so, but, but Zoom has fixed it for them, um, because they haven't been able to get to it yet. So, so, um, so your, your video from an ATEM uh, mini soon when, when this is all uh, released will look much better on Zoom than anything else. There you go, Mitchell. Yeah, I agree with Alex. I think it's way more specialized than we give it credit for. Um, theoretically, uh, the Zoom fix will interrogate the UVC as to whether or not there's an A10 mini and then apply whatever that filter is to that to make that correct. And if you just did a regular garden variety filter or LUT for that matter uh, that you could apply, it uh, wouldn't work well with other devices uh, because uh, there's no smarts in there to tell it whether or not it's connected to an A10 or not. And you said UVC. Is this for webcams mostly that are connected, is, or is well, it I mean, all cameras? What we're seeing right now is that is that the uh, that there is something going on with the Black Magic. Any any Black Magic software, not just UVC, but anytime it's compressing down. So whether it's streaming, we saw it with with off, with um, with our office hours stream as well. Anytime Black Magic is converting for a, a stream, whether it's RTMP, UVC, and so on and so forth, we're seeing this. Uh, change in the colors, which is crushing the blacks, um, and uh, and so uh, yeah, so that's so that is problematic on the, on a platform level for Black Magic, but um, Zoom through a lot of work has figured out how to get that data back, um, and but it's not filtering the it's not filtering the the image data. It is actually making you know really working deeply into the. And you know how it integrates with the hardware. So anyway, so I think that it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty powerful. And when it when it's released, I think it'll be it'll be great. So stay tuned. Nice. All right. Excellent. Let's move to the next question. Joaquin Matus from Imperial Valley, California. How does the role of a DP in a broadcasting live production compare to their role in a traditional film and TV production? Alex, start us off again. You know, typically the, um, the, the in a regular film and TV, it depends on if you're doing both of them are narrative, it's pretty similar. So, you know, like so a DP that's working for a, a um, film and then they're working on a TV show, they're going to have a very similar, um, you know, role. 
and that's going you know, as director of photography. That's what the DP stands for. Um, they're going to pay attention to what kind of cameras, and the, and oftentimes it depends on how much the director is a DP, right? So if, if a director came to being a director from a DP, they have a lot more opinions about things. A lot, some directors don't. So some directors are just going, I'll let the DP do what they're going to do. Like I have an idea of kind of what I want, but the DP will come up with framing. They'll come up with process. They'll come up with a lot of things. They won't direct the actual actors, but they'll really f build the frame. Um, and so, and it just depends on how much, how mu what the experience of the DP is, what the experience of, you know, but, but I know like when I work, my brother's a DP. And when I work with my brother, I just ask him, what do you think? <laughs> you know, or if I work on work with, like, I got some ideas of how I want to tell the story, but I, I, it's a negotiation between what he thinks will work and what I think will work. And, and, and I think that, um, same thing with like Brent by who I work with a lot, the, the, I, I ask them for their advice. They know how to use these cameras. They know how to use the lighting. They know how to do those things. Now, when you get a DP for a TV show, like a, if you see a DP and oftentimes you don't have that role specifically set out, but if you do have a DP for your, uh, a TV, a regular TV show in a set, it's usually a little bit, um, it usually has a little less responsibility than the one that's on, you know, because that, that's kind of a more of a cookie cutter process. There's a lot to be done at the beginning and then it doesn't change as much. But, but if you're doing narrative roles, generally the DP is, has a very similar role for TV or film. Um, in the old days, I would say the TV and film and music, you know, music videos, you kind of start as music videos or smaller things and end up in TV and film and, or TV and then end up in film, <laughs> you know, or, you know, start in broadcast and then go to film. Nowadays, there's not really any, the, the budgets for the TV or the streaming and TV broadcast or whatever are so big that, that DPs could go back and forth and the production isn't much different in size. So it's, um, so it's, it's a, it's, I, I would say it's a different environment than it was only maybe 10 years ago. Mitchell? Yeah, the Cliff Notes version of that is uh, TV, less people, film, more people, more people it's, making uh, but, decisions, but I, more I would people say that supporting that, uh, the, would, uh, the process of being the I, DP and I a would collaboration argue, between the director and the, uh, the cinematographer yeah. is uh, more intent on it's, film. It's just not that way anymore, though. Like, you know, the thing is, is the money for streaming and even even the narratives, it's just that there's it, it really it, you're absolutely right. It was that way 10 years ago. But at this point. The difference between narrative, if it's narrative, you know, it's narrative or broadcast or broadcast, you know, news or, or you know, whatever, you know, um, serial. But but the if it's a narrative film, it generally the production and the process is very similar between the two at this point because the budgets are the same. <laughs> are you saying you know? I'm living in the past, Alex? <laughs> I'm just saying it's 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 moved forward a little bit uh, because of, because again the the we streaming has really blurred the the you know blurred the lines between a feature film and and a streaming uh output so yeah. I, I remember when i worked in a studio um and i was the audio guy and uh, when the studio would uh, be booked for a tv narrative like you say it'd be just a couple of people there two or three people and yeah, uh, when it was a film shoot boom i mean catering yeah, that, and people and, just and i think amazing. some of that some of that has to do with um also, just the fact that we're shooting at much higher resolutions, and we're we're shooting with big, and people have just bigger expectations than what they have there. So, so now you're seeing, you know, those crews are, you know, the, the, for most ma major narratives, you're seeing the same the same production process that you would see anywhere else. I will pull out a small soapbox on this one because I've heard too many young people particularly uh, showing up and saying, I'm the director of photography. And for if you've worked with a serious director of photography, particularly someone who came out of the, the tradition, and I say that because this director of photography in America, they call them lighting cameramen in the British system. This is a level of supervisory decision making that is very technical and very precise. Uh, a true director of photography will spend hours thinking about lensing and exactly how they want to execute each shot in a shot list. Um, it's not just I bought a camera and so now I'm showing up on set and I'm calling myself the director of photography. You can still do that if you want, but you may get yourself into some difficulty if you get into a bigger set and you claim to be that and you don't have the, the technical, highly technical and experiential background to be able to make these kinds of aesthetic and practical decisions in conjunction with a director who's looking for a real DP. I 
I do everything I can to stay away from titles. I just show up and usually my, you'll see, I have credits that are kind of hidden in a lot of different things. And I just like to call myself innocent bystander. Like that's, yeah. that's, that's what I, I prefer is and people will be like, do you want to be this or that? And I'm like innocent bystander. I that's just my, saw it that's that's a period favorite. of time where there were a lot of people who bought a red camera and they showed up saying, I'm the DP. <laughs> they <laughs> say whatever you want to be. I mean, yeah, you know, know. It's, it's, so it's, you know, you might be, maybe you got a good eye. So yeah, who knows? Uh, let's dive into the next question. Diving with Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. What's the value proposition of linking an A10 Mini SDI versus A10 SDI Pro to complement the HDMI version of the A10 Extreme ISO? The Mini adds two outputs plus an SDI, SDI input capability for $345. Besides the ISO recording, what reasons to go with the $795 Pro? Alex. I saw this question and I was like, is there actually a smaller SDI version? Like, I didn't even know that that existed. Um, you know, I have a, I do have the SDI, um, oh, Blackmagic just changed their website. That's weird. Um, I, um, I have the SDI version of the Extreme. Um, and I have to admit that I just didn't, I didn't even know that they had built the smaller version. <laughs> so, so the, uh, they, they, they stuck that one out underneath, uh, underneath us. Um, I think that the, uh, uh, so I'm kind of um, looking at it very quickly. It doesn't look like, and the problem is they put them in different orders. You know, what, what they really need to do is, I mean, the big thing that I would say is, are they, you said it added two more outputs. And, and I will say the biggest problem that I have with most of the, the smaller switchers is the outputs, is how many outputs can I get? And I would pay, easily pay another, um, you know, the $345 for more outputs like you know the the limitation of having two outputs versus four i I believe the sdi the sdi oh but does the pro have i can't i'm having a hard time figuring this so they have a mini sdi versus the atem sdi pro so i guess that's there's only two outputs josh i'm trying to i'm trying to i have to admit that i haven't really been tracking the smaller switchers for a while and so I, i i didn't uh I didn't know that there were smaller ones. So Josh is like, outline that. I'm sure that it came out a long time ago, but I haven't been needing to buy these um, some of the smaller ones there. But I'm trying to figure out what the, it may just be the ISO records. I mean, there's a lot more storage in there um, to do the ISO records. So my guess is, is that that if it's the, or not storage, but there's a lot more, there's not storage in there, but there is a, uh, a lot more circuitry in there to do the ISOs. Um, Josh but, says both the mini and pro SDI have two times outputs. Yeah, yeah, I see that now. Um, the The difference in the extreme is that it goes from two to four, and that two that four we use up all of those really, really quickly. Um, you know, it would be nice if they gave us a um, uh, the problem with the 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 problem with the setup is that there's not really any comparison. You can't really like, like check mark, so I'd almost have to have it in front of me. But I will say that I think that the primary difference between the two is the fact that it has the circuitry to do, there's a lot more circuitry in there to do the ISO. And I think all the ISOs are a bit more expensive because of that. So I think that, and, and the one thing I would say is that, that, you know, so if you don't need to do ISO, um, then I would not, then you don't need the ISO version. I think that's probably the only primary version of that. I will say that I probably wouldn't buy one that couldn't do ISO. I don't do ISO very often, but I wouldn't buy, buy a switcher at that price if I, you know, for that doesn't do ISO at this point, because it's, it's a really great feature to have there so um but if, if you just need something that's going to sit on your desk and and make sw- and switch i think then it, then the uh that might be fine uh oh cj wanted to get on this cj yeah the other thing that you want to know that you want to keep in mind is do you want to record onto your hard drive while you're streaming over to uvc you get the second usb output uh with the extreme and then it's uh well no, the extreme or the or with the pro the Does pro the pro, the, the pro sdi the the, the four-channel SDI right. mixer, the smaller one, has one USB-A, two SDI outputs, four SDI inputs. Whereas when you get up to the extreme, you get no, but, four yeah, SDI but I think, outputs. But I think he's trying to compare between the, the, the Pro and the ISO. So they're both four. Both of the both four. four. The, both of the four. Yeah, it's, there's a... Oh, I see. There's the Pro and the ISO. And I think it's just the extra circuitry for the ISO. I think that's what you're paying for. It's just the extra circuitry that it takes to write to the, um, write to the external drive. And traditionally black magic charges you as little as they possibly can get away with uh, for their hardware so you're, you're probably seeing what the relative costs are between being able to record iso or not um, they're, they usually aren't aren't uh, aren't uh, doing that randomly <laughs> so so anyway 
Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, Josh, that gives you enough to go on. Let's go to the next question. Ian Alford in London, UK. I have 50 people in a room and I wanted them to be able to vote A or B to a question and see the live votes. I need them to be able to click multiple times to compete against the other side. So each side tries to win. Any ideas on how to do this? Alex, do you have any ideas? Uh, yeah, there's a couple a couple different ones that can be done. Um, there's a there's a software called Poll Anywhere. Uh, it probably will do what you need it to do, um, and it's, I don't think it's it's particularly hard to use. Um, so that'd probably be the one that I would that I would think about. Uh, we do have some of those tools inside of Mukana, but you, you know I don't know if you need to use Mukana just just to do that one thing. Um, we've done a lot of stuff with voting and, and inputs and so on and so forth. If you really want to talk about that, we, we we might be able to you know reach out to me. Um, to talk about that, but but as far as an off the shelf something that you can just order, uh, poll anywhere is probably the one you might want to start with. Uh, Slido will do things like that, but Slido is super expensive <laughs> compared to poll anywhere. Um, uh, so uh, and it requ usually requires a longer commitment. So um, so anyway, so you can uh, decide what you want to do there. So um, anyway, that's that's the uh, those would be the ones that I'd probably look at. Next question. John Foltz from Ceilings Grove, Pennsylvania, wants to know, when might we expect the MidJourney web version to launch? Alex, what do you think? Well, the mid, there, there is, it, I, you can't send prompts into MidJourney right now, but man, the web, the web interface right now is great. Like what it does is it, it lets you see every single thing that you've put in as a prompt with a picture of it. And it, it, so it, it saves all of those prompts out on the web version. Um, and, uh, and so it was, there was stuff that I did in the very early days that, that I couldn't scrolling up in discord. It's really hard to find, <laughs> you know, so, so the, uh, um, so anyway, so I think that it's, it is a, uh, uh, it, it, it has been really, really useful from, from my perspective of being able to go find something. Someone asked me, how did you get that? How did you get this certain look? And I was like, I don't remember how I got that look. And so I went, I had to, I went, I scrolled back. I saw those images. I looked at it and had the prompt, the image, all those things. And so the prompt isn't there yet, but it is, they're getting close. Um, and uh, I will admit that the Discord one is very convenient though, because you're sitting on your phone and you think of something funny or you think of something you need and you can start working on it really easily in Discord. But, but I do think that the web, they're, they're slowly building out the web version and it's, it's going well. Let's go to the next question. Matu, Matu LeCant from Oakland uh, has a question. Any thoughts and sources of creative design inspiration when creating lower thirds and other graphics? CJ, start us off. I say pick your favorite uh, entertainment, whether it's, uh, whether it's news, whether it's a YouTuber, whether it's the NFL. Pick something that you like that appeals to you and then uh, Take a screen grab, get a recording of it, try and recreate what those things look like. And then, uh, first of all, you get an appreciation for how hard they are to create. Uh, but also, you can just get an idea of design language. So that that's where I would go. Alex? Yeah, so I... Um, uh the number one reason I talk a lot about watching football games or whatever on YouTube TV, but the number one reason I used YouTube TV is to pull graphics. So to look at graphics and how they're, and so I do it relative, we, we show it about on the show about half as often as I look at it that way. And so I'll go through and grab, you know, what are the broadcasters doing right now? What are the, and they don't change that fast, but they, I mean, you know, if you, you pull it every six months or so, you'll see, a, you know, a change in the, in the view. The most money is spent on sports. So, and specifically in the United States, the most money is spent on football. So, if you look at the not the NFL foot, not the NFL feeds that happen on Saturday, those are worthless. Um, but the if you look at the the CBS and NBC and ABC uh, feeds, you'll see some a lot of money, especially the NBC one and the, the Thursday night football one. You'll see a lot of money. They spent the the NB, the Sunday night football or NBC feeds as well as the Thursday night football. That's where all the money went you know, for, for those things. So you'll see that state of the art learning how to do those. I could probably do a class that lasted a year to teach students how to do those lower thirds. That would be, that's about how long it would take to go from scratch to those. Cause it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but looking at lots of other broadcasters, lots of other things, look at what you can achieve. I will say that one of the best ways to get good at motion graphics is to look at other people's stuff and copy it verbatim to the pixel. Force yourself to do that. That's how I got into doing um, computer. I 
started just grabbing onto graphics and just making it look exactly the way they looked with a different logo or different whatever, just to learn how to do it. Next thing I knew is I was doing an open for HBO. <laughs> so, so anyway, so the, um, so you got to prove that you can put those things together and reproduce it in whatever app you're, you're going to plan for. Um, I'm actually looking at doing some of these. We've been starting to talk about motion more. I'm thinking about putting together some of these lower thirds, like here's a broadcast lower third. Here's what it would take to do in motion, like to do that, to do exactly what you're seeing there of what that would look like. And so, so anyway, um, just to, just as an exercise, but I think that that's the best way to learn how to do these is to look at lots of other ones. And I would recommend whether it's YouTube TV or something. YouTube TV is the easiest one because you can hit record on everything. You just go through every broadcaster, every live show, everything. You just hit record, record, record. And it'll just keep recording all of them for you forever. And then you just go through and start searching and grabbing them. What I do is I, I put those out of my computer as a feed into a recorder. When <laughs> I just hit record and I just start skipping through them and hitting play, skipping through them and hitting play. And I end up with one long piece that is all these lower thirds um, that are all recorded. And then bring that typically into Final Cut and I go slice in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And I end up, and I squeeze that all into, you know, about a two minutes of, you know, 30 different lower thirds. Mitchell. I go to two places. Uh, like Alex said, you can get a lot of inspiration from what's on TV. And by the way, there's a huge, huge difference between what, for example, the BBC does with lower thirds and what CNN does. It's, uh, it's uh, quite a spread. CNN um, another my place eyes. to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, the squishing text uh, is definitely uh, Alex's kryptonite. But another place to look is uh, any place that sells templates for lower thirds. You can get inspiration seeing cool stuff that's done. And if you're lazy like me, occasionally you can buy one of them and take it apart because everything is right there for you. And I do it in After Effects. So it's nice to see a really cool lower third graphic and see how they put that all together. And most of the time, I'll modify it just enough to make it cool for me. Chris Fenwick. You know, the thing that I think is interesting about the question is uh, creative design. And I think that I think that a lot of what we end up seeing is um, digital flexing, sometimes uh, on a manufacturer's part and a lot of times on the designer part. I think a lot of it is done because we can and i always find myself going back to the question of of why you know like like why and you know you could say well it's great it grabs your attention and it's beautiful but is it then distracting from the rest of the show is it pulling me out of the experience of what i'm supposed to be doing if you look at nfl graphics you don't want something like that in your corporate video it would be completely out of place and distracting and uh, it, it, it serves no purpose. It serves no purpose. So design also uh, uh, requires that you look at context and what is it doing for this production now and is it helping my show along or is it just me showing off because I can do fancy stuff? That re resonates with me because as soon as you said that, I thought of the movie Seven, which had at the time groundbreaking titles. The titles were creepy and the movie was creepy and it just all worked together. That's different than just throwing them up because they look cool. CJ. Remember any what we learned uh, over the last three Tuesdays with Alex Golner was that almost any final cut title that you get, you can pull apart in motion. So that was just going to be my other reminder, kind of to echo what Mitch had said, uh, that you know pull, when you get to pull them apart. You can learn a lot. Yeah, we do that all the time. With it. It's very cool. Alex. Yeah, and I, and I would say that um, I agree with Chris. I, when I do, uh, most of my lower thirds are very simple because I'm trying to keep you focused. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm giving you what you need, which is when I feel like I'm watching something and, and think, who is that person? Like, and I go, oh, I should tell some people it's Chris. Like, it's Chris Fenwick. You know, I'm going to put a little Chris Fenwick across the bottom. But I, it's when I think that the viewer is going to think, I want to know who that person is. I'm going to put that up or put it up again. But I usually try to make it really subtle. Like, I'm just kind of sliding you something. Like, I'm just handing you something. Oh, by the way, that's that's that person there. And so I, I, I like mine to be pretty low key. But I like to look at, you know, we have clients that want to have things look a little bit more snazzy. Um, and, 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 you know, sometimes you what you want to do is know that you know how to do it. Like you can do it. You don't necessarily recommend it, but you don't want to say no and no and no, and then they go find somebody else that can do it. Um, and so, you know, having the, that, that, that arrow in your quiver is, 
I think, important. And understanding why you're choosing what you're choosing, I think, is important. But I think that, that um, but I oftentimes do agree that I tend to be low key about what I do as far, I mean, if you look at the lower thirds here, I mean, that's Tuomo's look, you know, feel. I think he kind of just made that up and we were like, yeah, it looks great. But that's, it's very in line with the kind of stuff that I like, which is just not a lot of over the top, um, you know, um, graphics. That said, uh, and, and I do, one thing I want to underline with what Chris said, is that that's not just with graphics. One of the things we have to be careful of when we do shows and when we do events is are we entertaining the event company and the and the clients who do events all the time or are we actually serving the people who showed up? You know, because I think a lot of the stuff that we do in events um, is stuff that we think is cool because we're bored of doing these corporate events. <laughs> and so we're like, let's have a horse, you know, like, 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 like let's, let's have, let's, let's, let's add fire and horse. smoke, you know, let's, let's do something because like, we're bored, you know, and, but does it actually add to the experience of the user in that they feel like that was worth their time? And, and I think some of the time it is, I mean, some of the time it's really cool. I think that, Google had these things that they would do in, in I.O. And, and Atmosphere and a couple of the other things where they're really imaginative, um, you know, these um, incredible things. And it it really made it worth being there on time because it would always happen at the very beginning and it would just be these incredible, um, uh, you know, opens and you'd always want to be there because you'd want to see whatever they did. And they spent a lot of effort on those. And and so so I think that it can be worth it, but it, I think you have to be kind of careful of, there's a lot of times when people just do stuff that's really cool and it's, it's just because the designers are bored, you know? And so, so I think you do have to always try to separate that out. Uh, let's go back to Mitchell. Mitchell. Uh, Matthew, uh, one of my favorite anecdotes is everybody wants to be an art director. And that means that you can start out with a great idea and politically it gets uh, moved into a corner that's not so good. Uh, Chris is famous for the, uh, uh, the audio. Yeah, you, Chris. Uh, the uh, make famous. the logo bigger because I uh, generally. I, I saw it on, on a billboard because he's famous. Make the logo bigger is uh, is one of your uh, enemies. And while you're at it, uh, get rid of those bugs. Dancing bugs in the corner of the uh, lower third area uh, is very distracting, particularly if you're watching uh, a movie and all of a sudden there's this thing dancing and waving and it's distracting. That doesn't work. So that's my art direction for you. Chris, do you have a final wrap up before we move on? Uh, uh, I'm sorry, wrong thing. Uh, uh, absolutely. I fall into the category, Alex. You said... You want to be able to do that stuff in case you get asked to, but you should probably downplay it. I actually fall into the category of, I, I, really, you want to do all that? Well, you should call Alex and Lindsay. He, he knows how to do that <laughs> stuff. Pixel perfect. But yeah. but I'll try and talk you off that ledge because really you're make, probably making a mistake for your company. Let's move on to the next question. Douglas Carmichael here with a question. A panelist mentioned permanently installed cameras connected via SRT. Wouldn't NDI be the protocol you'd want for a venue installation because of the high latency of SRT? Alex? Yeah, if I was building a, if I was building a facility and I was going to use um, IP to move the stuff around, I would definitely use NDI over SRT. Um, I would, you know, SRT, if I wanted to start going uh, into a wider ne area network, I would use SRT instead of NDI, which, and there's some people who do the opposite of that. <laughs> some always want to use NDI or always want to use SRT, but I would use them where they're, they're most useful. Makes sense. Next question. Justin Geller from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The After Hours crew recommended the Dell 3930 rack for a media server for a few years back, and I loved them. Now that they're discontinued, do you have new recommendations for a rack mount server with a graphics card for about $2,500? Alex Salvamel. Well, while those are, are are discontinued, I would say there's probably another Dell that's in the same, we, you know, in the same area to do that. I don't know exactly what the number is, but I don't think Dell might have discontinued the 3930, but I don't think they discontinued the, the, the form factor. So I would look at something that's roughly in that. I think that anything in that price range is going to be enough to do what you're probably trying to do at this point. Mitchell? My concern is uh, to buy a decent NVIDIA uh, graphics card it may cost twenty five hundred dollars. Oh no, so, not, uh, not for tough to not do for that. play out. I mean, if you're if you're doing graphics, you're absolutely right. But but for play out, it wouldn't be you know a uh, you wouldn't need much of a graphics card. I mean, it's a four hundred dollar game card will will do the do the work for you um, at this point. 
And don't forget, this show is driven by your questions, not just your questions, but your vote on the questions. So if you have questions to toss in, go to askofficehours.global. Uh, or if you want to, go back into the early, check the website for how you can get into Mukana on the back end. There you can not only put your questions in, you can vote on them and vote them up or down. The ones that get the most votes, we get to earliest and talk about longest. Let's go to the next question. Walt Palmer from Lewis, Delaware. One of my show hosts now employs Bluetooth hearing aids. Any recommendations for a Bluetooth transmitter that I can connect to the headphone output of the Studio Mix console? Alex. You know, a lot of those, um, those, those headsets interact with their phones. I don't know if you can tie the phone in or not, um, but a lot of them, are they have their own software. So if they have Bluetooth, they typically have their own software on how to integrate with... Uh, your phone so that it works properly. I don't have enough information about that. The ones that, when we do in ears like this, we're typically using Phonak, but we're not using the Bluetooth part of Phonak. We're using the RF version of Phonak, and so so I don't know. <clears throat> I don't know about a specific one for you there, but I would say I would look at the software that that's coming with um, you know because what we've done to do those kinds of things um, is a transmission to a phone act, um, you know, from a transmitter that's getting literally just XLR ins. <laughs> so, so I don't know. Uh, so I don't know how the, how that one works specifically, but I would look at the apps that are available on the phones. Yeah. And I know there's been a lot of work in the hearing aid space. I have not explored that, but I know that in the three to $5,000 hearing aid space, which is robust and global and has some big, big companies in it, they almost all do Bluetooth. I only know about that because I was talking to a friend of mine who's a CEO at a company and he said, yeah, in half the meetings, I'm listening to a ball game, <laughs> my hearing aid, <laughs> and nobody can tell him not to do it because it's his hearing aid. <laughs> what he sends into it is his business. So, uh, yeah. Mitchell? Yeah, be careful, too, because uh, some of those uh, Bluetooth devices are two-way street. So the last thing you want to have happen is the audio to go back into the console when you don't expect it. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go to the next question. Sam Reed in Maine. Examples from Mike Verta's Star Wars Legacy Restoration Show. Far better black levels when you projected them, uh, even the letterbox bars, on other files I've tested. How might I use this example as a model to improve baseline projection of all other files? Ooh, big question. Alex. Uh, look at it in scopes and figure out where those black levels are that you like them. <laughs> so, so I think that if you're getting, if you think that those black levels are better, figure out where those are. I would, you know, start analyzing the frame mathematically as opposed to looking at it and simply open that up and start to compare those, compare where are those black levels that I really like compared to where the black levels are and start to look at how you manage your, your um, envelope so that it fits into that and you'll find that you have better. I mean, that's not the only solution. There's probably other things going on there. So you have to really look at those but but if you can especially if you can get any kind of test frames or anything else but being be able to measure where the black levels are that you like for that is um, is i would use be using scopes and 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 uh color analyzation tools as opposed to my eye to, to figure that out yeah i see the the words legacy restoration and i worry a little if it's coming from really early content i remember that when i was first doing my engineering studies the u.s pedestal level for ntsc was 7.5 ire for blacks uh in the pacific rim particularly sony and companies like that that i was working with theirs was zero so there was a difference in the fundamental black level of the two different systems and i remember getting legacy stuff even later in my career after i'd migrated into all digital digital and had the joy of being able to get my blacks down to zero that i would get contact that had been recorded into the old system and i could not get true black without messing with the pedestal, which would affect the the darkness of a lot of content. So just um, when I saw Legacy Restoration, I went, oh, gosh, I'm wondering if you're dealing with the fact that black didn't used to be black, really, on the old NTSC broadcast system. It's just one of the things you have to kind of know and, and pay attention to. Let's go to the next question. Paul Wallace from Hot Springs, Arkansas, has this question. Samsung is likely to have new phones in February. Any rumors on new features? And is the camera likely to be the best ever on any phone? What do you think, Alex? Sure. <laughs> I mean, I, mean you know, like, like, I, think that, I think we're kind of past that. I mean, the, the, the problem is, is that, you know, you want to make a great phone for Android users. I don't think that, so the phone is, I mean, the camera 
for most people is the most important part of the phone. So that is like when Apple does its release, all of us are just waiting. Like they did their whole phone release and they did all this other stuff. And all we were waiting for is what are the, what are the camera specs? Like, I don't care about anything else on the phone other than just what are the camera specs? I don't care. You added an extra button or you, or it, it, the, it lasts two more hours of battery. No one cares. No one cares. Like all we care about is like, what does the phone look like? I mean, what does the camera look like? And um, so it's important. At this point, do you really expect iPhone users to jump to Android for the camera or Android users to jump to an iPhone for the camera? Highly unlikely. So, you know, what they're, you know, so the thing is, is it might be, but as a, you know, I think that if, if you're an iPhone user, you're going to be like, well, I'm just waiting for September. And if you're a, an Android user, you're trying to make a decision. I think Samsung makes arguably the best Android phones out there with Google, you know, neck and neck in the pixel and so on and so forth. But I think that the, um, uh, but I think those are the, those are the two, cam if, if I was going to buy an Android phone, a new Android phone, I've got some older Android phones. If I was going to buy an Android phone, I'd buy a Samsung most likely. Um, so they're going to, I'm sure it's going to be great, but, but the chances of it really making any impact on how people use it. Uh, I mean, the big thing that when we look at phones, the thing that keeps on coming up is that the, the poll that 87% of kids under 18 are using iPhones nothing else was, is going to matter soon, <laughs> you know, because like, you know, as they get older, you know, and they have all of their movies and everything else embedded into it, it's, it's, a, it's a real problem that Android has to figure out. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I think you're exactly right about that. If you're in an ecosystem now, you're sticking with it because you probably have so much mental real estate devoted to how it works. I'm wondering how many people are actually using it. There's a new programmable button, right, on the, on the 15... Uh, high-end yeah. phones, and I wonder how many people are even using it. It's not that it's a bad feature or that people can't, but I just think people have only so much bandwidth for operating changes that... I just that, don't care. Like, I was like, sure, yeah. gave me another button. If anything, it means it's one more button I, I have to watch But when I try to put it into a clamp for, you know, when I try to put it into something. Like, it, <laughs> the, that one extra button caused so much trouble with all these cases, and I was like, do I really care that that button exists? Not really. Like, all I yeah. care about is how good is the camera. It is interesting. I have found on some uh, functions like that, I would ignore it for the first year I owned the phone. But then suddenly one day I would think, oh, I could do that with it. Maybe I'm watching a YouTube video or something. Oh, well, let me try it. And the next thing you know, I'm using it all the time. It, it just speaks to me that there's so much functionality in these phones these days that people don't even go near or use or, or, and until or, you or, really need it. Or, like or what? I don't, you know, I don't use a lot of apps that swipe right or left. I don't use any of those apps. And um, so as a result, there is no time that I want to swipe right or left, ever. <laughs> like, you know, and so when it accidentally, every time my phone swipes right or left with new content, I got something new for you. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I wish there was a button and there was somewhere in my phone that just said never swipe right or left. Like, just never, like, never, it, you just de de disable that to go to the app so that system wide, I can say I never want to go right or left on my phone. I just now see, and, and I use it every day because when I walk, it is the difference between my walk tracking and my audio book that I'm listening to. So I swipe yeah, left I and right it. 20 times while I'm on a, mm -hmm. an exercise walk, fitness walk. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it just mm -hmm. depends on what you need to do. Those are the features that are the most important for you. And this weekend, if they can get you to them. Yeah. This week in curmudgeons. Uh, yeah, <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah, so. Mitchell. Hey, speaking of curmudgeons, does the Samsung have a uh, headphone jack like my, uh, oh my gosh, iPhone 6? No. Oh, We've all gotten rid of it. No, yeah. no, we don't have water ports okay. in ours. Okay. Enough with oh. it. <laughs> you know, I did find a, uh, I sat on my iPhone once and broke it in half. So I had the first folding iPhone, just so for the record. I'm j we're all joking. At this point, the... The amazing things in our carry around phones, all manufacturers are amazing. Let's move on to the next question. Tony Mobley from Noonan, Georgia asks, our setups have evolved so much since pandemic. Is there a use case for Raspberry Pi? Alex, take us into this. Now, I have to admit, my Raspberry Pi is with my son. He's working on it. He's doing stuff with it. I, I still think that they're, you know, the Raspberry Pi is a great little playback system if you're looking for little things that you want to throw in there as fills. That's what I used to use the Raspberry Pi for. So I, I'm saying, yes, there is a still use case for it uh, with something like Playout B. No, I don't have it in here because I gave my Raspberry Pi to my son. Um, I am looking at getting a five to, to play with it and see how, it, you know, see if I can put it back in there. Um, but uh, I think that there's still it's it's great as an inexpensive little way to put some put some content in there. So I, I I do think that it's potentially a place for it, but I haven't been using it recently. 
Let's go to the next question. Paul Wallace from Hot Springs, Arkansas. Is there any difference between a Dodge Grand Caravan, a Plymouth Voyager, and Chrysler Pacifica for gear hauling? Discuss seat stowing. Okay, CJ, dive in. Well, the last the last Plymouth rolled off the line in the early 2000s, so they absorbed that into the into the Chrysler brand. But uh, in general, uh, the, well, they've taken the Voyager and they've rebranded that as the budget Chrysler now. In general, the it, the trim, the appointments, the creature comforts are going to be nicer in the Chrysler than the Dodge. Regardless of which model you choose, they all have the availability of what they call their brand is stow and go seating. I did a location shoot with this one time, and the, the ability for those seats to just fold into the floor and have this go from a people mover to a gear mover was game changing. It was the best rental I ever did. I was five hours from home, and it was just, I was everybody's hero because I rented that car. There you go, Alex. Uh, I still own one. <laughs> that, that is my car. <laughs> like So is, is the Dodge Caravan. And, and the reason I do it is because it normally has all the seats down. So I can, it's like a little truck that I can move things around. My wife borrows it. She went, she went to get, um, she had to get some car, new carpets or whatever. She's like, can I borrow the car? Because I can, I can put all that stuff in it. But I can pull the seats up and, and then the whole family can go somewhere and we still have some storage in the back. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know what the differences are. I will say that I love that caravan and I'll use it until it dies um, because it's, again, it's like my little truck that I go around with, but it's enclosed and, and I can, and I, but I have seats if I need them. And if my, ki if my kids and their friends, I need to drive them somewhere, I can pull all the seats up and then I put them back down and I have my truck back. So, so it's not, I don't think I'm, it's not, it's not the cool car, but I'm not trying to be cool anymore. So anyway, so it's, it's a good car that, 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 that works. Um, and uh, we, we got into them because of those, the stow and go was the reason we bought them. We used to have two or three of them in pixel core. And, um, uh, the, and we had one of them where you can actually get them where it's all metal on the bottom so that the seats don't come up and then you just slide things into them and it, it works out really nicely. Uh, you know, we used them a lot and it was, again, it was a people mover when it needed to be a people mover and it was a, a gear mover. You could, you'd be surprised at what you can stuff into a Dodge Caravan, you know, it's, it's, it's like a bag of holding, you know, you can just keep on pushing back, you know, cases into it. So, um, it, it was, it was pretty effective. So, so I don't know what I generally the Chrysler's just look, look shinier than the Dodges and they have better little increments, but they're a great, they're a great car. Uh, Mitchell in Hollywood, they're the Cadillac of minivans. There you go. There you go. And don't forget, your questions drive the show. So if you have a question, go to uh, askofficehours.global. You can pop them in there. Uh, we're burning through questions today. Excellent questions, as always, and excellent answers, I hope, for all of you. So pop a question in if you have one, and uh, we'll get to it really quickly today. Next question. Jack Rupel from Breckenridge, Colorado. Rather than modern, modern or anime effects with Insta 360 AI warp, I want to show obsolete tech while discussing subjects prior to 1994 with obsolete hardware, 9600 baud modem, rotary phone, punch card computer, etc. And Alex, I think that'd be good. I think I think, I think we've talked about it a lot of going through obsolete. Uh, obviously stuff. I think the big thing is just figuring out your studio. I think the studio needs to be very kind of uh, feel, if you're going to show stuff from the 80s, I, I feel like the studio has to feel like it's from the 80s. So I think you're really buying into a whole, um, and I think you need to get one of those members only, is it a members only jacket or whatever, like with a little <laughs> thing. Right. So you got to get that. Yeah. Uh, I think you need a little slightly larger glasses. You need to find some Brill Cream. Brill cream is really important for you. To put little in dabble, do you? Little, yeah, exactly. And then, and then you just have to. I mean, I think that there's a whole shtick here to to get it all just right. Um, you got to have your Atari twenty six hundred in the background, and uh, I'm trying to think of all the other things. You know, but but you have to kind of put all that stuff in there. Something has to have multiple colors, like orange and yellow and brown. Those are really popular colors that should be some maybe on the back your back wall, and it should go like this, and then zigzag go across because that's what all, all of our rooms <laughs> the graphics you know, like graphics. the green, like, green appliances we used to have yeah, like, yeah we have to have a green microwave and anyway so um so anyway i think that i think that it would be a fun it'd be a fun show you know and you could you could uh you know, like, I, I, yeah, a bunch of us have tried have been talking about talking about obsolete stuff for quite some time we haven't quite got around to it but i think that you're uh I think I think you're on you're on to something there. Um, yeah, a bunch of us have obsolete stuff in our backgrounds. Yeah, Let's exactly. see, there's my 1984 original Mac 128 sitting back there. I still have to find the cord and pop it up and see if it still functions. CJ, 
And if you have a functioning computer in the background, make sure that it always indexes and goes off of your flying toasters at 40 minutes past the hour during showtime every day. <laughs> flying toasters and the sheep wipes and other right things now, from the dawn of indexing, computing. Index. Yeah. Indexing. Indexing. I turned Sherlock off. I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> Let's dive into the next question. Diving into Roscoe Jones' question, Roscoe's from Madison, Indiana. Another auto question is touting ATSC 3.0 growth this past year, like saying they're selling more radar detectors to Model T owners, or will it save broadcasters? Oh, what will save broadcasters? And this is linked from a tvtechnology.com uh, magazine article. I don't. I, are they still publishing a magazine? I think so. Uh, they've been around forever, and we'd see them in NAB a lot. Alex, start us off. Uh, nothing's going to save it. Like it's, we're, we're past that, you know, and, and so I think that ATSC 3.0 growth, uh, I mean, I love it when they say that people are twice as likely to get some disease if they drink something or use these kinds of pans or anything else, but that's going from 0.0001% to 0.0002%. <laughs> like the, sure, they're twice as much, but what, what what is the reference point? Like, 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 what is the, you know, like what, you know, and how many, you know, like, and so, so, um, uh, so I think this is one of those cases where, yeah, a lot of people, you know, are using it, but I mean, almost nobody I know even, you know, uses their antennas anymore. Like, it, I don't, and, and I'm sure it's different in other parts of the country, but I'm, I can tell you in California, I mean, people aren't, you know, that these broadcast standards and a lot of these things are, I mean, I think people are trying to hang on and they, you know, we have to, and I think we see this in a lot of a lot of industries. Um, there's a saying that to know the truth, you can be neither for nor against it. And and I think that there and I think that this is the problem you get into with a lot of industries is that they really want it to be a way that it's not, you know. And so they really want broadcast to survive. They, you know, this is their business. They want this thing to happen, and so they keep on having these rosy projections, and they get excited about things that don't matter. Because they're not for, they are for, or they are for it or against it. They're not, they're not neutral, and so they don't, they can't see what's coming, um, you know. And I think that that's the, um, that's always the challenge is to, is to be able to see it. And I just think that you know, broadcast as we know it is over. Um, you know, it's not going to go away. It's just not going to be as important. I mean, we're still listening to the same technology. Well, we're about to stop listening to some of the same technology on our cars. Um, but but we're still listening to AM and FM radio. Those technologies are 100 years old. It's not like it's going to go, these aren't going to go, you know, they're not going to go away, um, at, at least just yet. Um, you know, there's, you know, people are, you know, so the, a lot of these older technologies are still there, um, but but they start to become more of a curiosity than they are a core technology. And I think that we're kind of moving towards where broadcast has become more of a curiosity. Mitchell? Yeah, look at uh, what Alex is saying there. I mean, remember AM stereo? That really went over like a ton of bricks. Um, ATSC 2.0 has barely been done by most broadcasters, and upgrade to 3.0 and all its capabilities would require a big, big budget to be able to do that. So on the broadcaster's side, they don't have the money to do these kinds of things. On the consumer side, they just don't care. It's like when cassettes came around to FM. Uh, people were concerned that cassettes would replace it. They sounded just fine. In a car, they sounded perfectly. So I just think it's a much ado about nothing uh, for that. And the same thing with FM radio, HD1, HD2. Again, I think it's a bit of a failure. It's really hard to get people to move off of technology that they've gotten used to. I, I see that still. I still have one producer that I work with a good little bit who brings scripts in on paper. And he's an extraordinary writer, has a Clio. And and he's used to working this way. And he'll bring in 10 pieces of paper, each one that has five potential headlines on it. And so we're looking at 50 headlines. And I'm going, you know, just on an iPad, that would be so much easier. We could all look at it. We could all mark it up. We could comment on it. But it's how he likes to work, and he's not willing to move off of that. And I see that over and over again, not just with individuals, but with big companies. When I have to deliver into broadcast and get a page of broadcast specs, I'm going, what century are you living in? I, you know, this is back when we had engineers, and I've told this story before, and I'll just do it really quickly. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I used to fix my spots and send them out to multiple stations according to those broadcast specs. It was the pandemic. I said, listen, I'm going to toss this on Vimeo. If you can 
get it on your station. We'll pay you to run the spots. And 95% of the stations all use the Vimeo file just fine, meaning that none of those specs they were pushing to me before were really mission critical. They were just entropy. People had done it this way forever, so they kept doing it this way. You've got to eventually move on and understand that the game has changed out from under you. Alex, you had another comment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, again, it's, it's, it's one of those things that um, that we what we want to look at is critical mass. Does it is it maintaining critical mass or has it gaining critical mass? You know, MP3s were really kind of an edge product for a couple of years. At some point, enough people were using them. And the key is to when you're watching an industry, at some point, enough people are doing it that the market is big enough for newcomers to invest in it. And as soon as it reaches that point, um, and if it's a superior technology, it's going to suddenly roll over. That's why everyone like so. So like when MP3s are really, 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 really small, but Napster didn't necessarily survive. But what it did is it meant that everybody knows how to use an MP3. And at that point, everything kind of blew up, you know, of, of what was available. And so so the thing is, is you want to look at markets where there's something that's coming and it gets to a certain size. And once it gets to that size and it's in the same respect, once you lose that certain size, people stop investing in it and, and then it just starts to fade kind of into the background. But again, a lot of these things stick around. They just don't, you know, they don't manage it. And, and you know, we can say there's all kinds of things we wish would happen, but, you know, hope is not a strategy, you know, and, and you need to like stop. I mean, I like, I'd like to say that I'm often, I'm hopeless. I don't hope that anything happens. I look at, try, I try to figure out what's going to happen and what I'm going to actually get done. <laughs> like, you know, and so, and so I, I, I don't hope like I, you know, if, again, in meeting with me, if you say I hope something's going to happen, you'll you'll get hope is not a strategy almost immediately. Because I used to be in a company that I used to work for a company that would say that <laughs> no one's allowed to be. Everyone was had to be hopeless all the time. Don't hope about anything. And so I think this is a lot of hopeful thinking. I'm hopeful for the next question. <laughs> Douglas Carmichael is here uh, with VMware sh shifting to a subscription-based licensing model. Have you investigated other virtualization platforms? Uh, VMware, interesting. Alex, what do you think? Um, you know, I've mostly used Parallels in the past for virtualization and not, not as much VMware. Um, so on the, from the Mac to the Windows, uh, subscription's coming. Like, it's, you can decide, oh, I don't want to be part of it. But the problem is, is that the companies that do subscription, especially for stuff like what VMware does, um, are going to be more vibrant They're gonna, because they have a better cash flow. And, you know, I mean, companies, anyone who runs a company will tell you that cash flow is everything, you know, and so what subscriptions solve is cash flow. Um, and so and so for these companies that not have, especially now that they've reached, there was some point where you keep on adding features and people would keep on upgrading and people would keep on buying it. But you're now getting to a point as you reach saturation, how do you keep on generating revenue? So I think you're going to keep on seeing more and more subscription. I don't. I don't think it's something you can. You, I think you have to be picky about what you're subscribing to. If you're not using it, get rid of it. Like I'm. Like at the end of the year, I'm really conscious to subscriptions, and I get rid of them as I and I, I try to clean out my drawers of subscriptions at the end of every year. And I'm doing that right now. And I probably lowered my monthly subscriptions by a hundred. I think 180 dollars right now per month that I'm not spending on. Six dollars here and thirty dollars there and twenty dollars here and fifteen dollars there. It adds up, and I suddenly and so every and every year it kind of just the cruft of subscriptions keeps building, um, and again you you have to pay it. But if you're using it and you're paying for it, then you know if you're leasing a car and you're paying for it, or you're you have a house and you're making. I mean, I'm, I don't know, I'm make payments for the rest of my life on this house. So so the thing is, is that you you have the the um, uh, you know that process. Um, of subscription. We we do pay for those subscriptions in lots of parts of our lives. And it's here to stay. <laughs> I'd probably give up on that one. Yeah. Next question. And it's a QR code question coming in from Anawahi Black Bear Marshall from Hawaii. There has been a recurring and increasing problem with HDCP blocking on Samsung TVs and a few others when connected to a Roku box and some Apple TVs after updates in the past few months. How do we legally fix this the right way so we can go back to using these boxes? Alex, what do you think? I mean, it should be just a handshake problem with it, and it should be a firmware update on the... And so what the, how the HDCP works, of course, this is the copyright protection, is it needs a handshake. It's, if, if there's no handshake, it won't send... So it has to, it has to be a licensed input, and, it, and, and the box will say, okay, hey, I need, I need to know if you're licensed. And they go, I'm licensed. And they go, okay, here's the content. 
And um, if it's happening with these Samsung TVs, my guess is, is that there's some kind of firmware update. Uh, it's probably not the Roku or the Apple TVs. It's probably something in the phone, in the TV itself. Um, but, uh, you know, if, as far as, uh, you know, um, there is, so that that's what I would say. The less legal thing, but common thing is that a lot of inexpensive converters will do the HDCP handshake and then hand off the signal without any uh, HDCP. <laughs> so, and I've noticed, so, you know, so like, a lot of us who do events, what I was saying, a lot of us who do events, we have a problem that we have to run into projections and production and everything else. And so a lot of times we use production ready things that are designed for this so that we don't have to deal with HDCP. So there's, you know, there are things out there that are both, you know, that again, it's, it's, uh, there's lots of ways around it. It's, it's not a very strong format um, because, you know, you have to balance uh, convenience with uh, security. And if you make it too hard, then no one will use it. And so as a result, it's not that hard to get around if you have to. And I have noticed that sometimes my permissions in things that are licensed and gets around the DHCP, particularly subscriptions to uh, over-the-top services and things like that, will break for a little while and they have to be reprovisioned. They have to reconnect them. I have lost premium services for a week before I noticed that for some reason the handshake was no longer locked together and something that I do subscribe to is asking me to subscribe again. It's really annoying. CJ? The other thing you want to look out for, especially with cables that are uh, a little bit older or a little bit longer, is they do degrade over time, especially if you're going to flex them. So the first thing that I would check is, you know, get a nice 2.0, 2.1, whatever your most modern cable is that's going to be in that spot. Swap that out and make sure that that's working before you go ahead and, uh, you know, wait and hope because <laughs> we like to be in control. Uh, next question. QR code from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. What black magic design adapters or other products have the capability to apply LUTs directly to them? And what is the process of importing LUTs? Alex. Yeah, so I I have to admit the only one that I've used has been the HDMI to SDI, con or it's either HDMI or SDI or SDI to HDMI converter, like the 6G. I know works because that's what we've used it for. And what it takes is that you can you can connect it to your computer and you can you can copy over a uh, you'll there's like a little controller and you can copy over a, a cube file and typically a 33 point cube file um, that you're going to throw into it. And so those are the ones that we've used in the past. I want to say that these little bi-directionals will do it, but I haven't done it myself. I've got some here. I'll try to figure it out. So if you ask that question next week, I'm, I maybe I'll, I'll see if I can pull out some of these boxes. I'm not sure what the minimum minimum size box is, but I think that some of these SDI to HDMI converters that are smaller do have it. It's not a very hard thing for them to add. I'm kind of surprised it's not in all the boxes at this point. Um, but but we'll we'll take a look and see if we can't find uh, the, the the lowest cost version of this that will do it. And I just don't haven't tested them enough to know. I know that that HDMI to SDI or SDI to HDMI the 6G converters do it, but they're a little bit more expensive. So um, uh, we'll we'll take a look at that. Let's go to the next question. Mark Hesseling from Englewood, Colorado, has a QR code question for Alex, who likes to cite the generational use difference between an iPhone and an Android, but the current world market is a 70% favor of Androids. Does he really believe that the generational usage will overcome the large of a difference? Alex? No, no. And the rest of the world, it'll probably be still Android, but there's just a, I'm just talking about money. Like, you know, like, you know, like where the money's going and in the United States, the, that's where, that's where an enormous amount of it is. Uh, so no, I don't think, I, I think it's, I think it's incredibly good for all of us that there is a robust, um, competition between Android and, 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 and Apple, I mean, in, in the iPhone. So I, iOS and Android, you know, having relatively even parts of the market, um, I think is great and I hope it never stops. So I hope that there's no overcome, but I will say that, a lot of people on the Android side are very, in the United States, are very concerned about the fact that almost no kids are using Android phones. That's why that's why and Google's making such a big deal about RCS is because they got to figure out some way to get rid of the green bubbles, which is, is, isn't going to happen with what they're doing right now. But they're hoping to, that it'll work there. But I think it's great. I think the, the best thing that Google ever did for Apple, I mean, Apple, Steve Jobs wouldn't agree, but I think the best thing Google ever did for Apple was create Android. You know, because it because it, it it otherwise Apple would have antitrust stuff all the time. <laughs> like so, so um, so I think that I think both of them benefit from from the other side. Yeah, I think in the telephone space particularly, we've seen that competition thing. If if it all coalesces in one brand, 
the regulators start giving it a very, yep. very close look. And eh. anyway, um, we're about to transition into our second hour for today. I'm looking forward to this. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, some notes before then. The Isadora Lab, as always, happens on Thursday. So El Wilson Spiro will be here. If you haven't paid attention to Isadora, if you do anything with show control and things like that, it's an amazing thing. It's part of what runs the back end of this show. And this gives you an opportunity, an incredible opportunity, to learn how to use Isadora for your own projects, kind of get your mind around this type of thing. We had the show yesterday about show control, and um, there's just a lot of a lot of weight, a lot of interest going on there. So uh, it's a big deal, and we appreciate uh, everybody being a part of this. Uh, also, just a moment to say thank you to everybody for all of your participation here. If you haven't been in the back end of what we do on office hours, if you haven't gone through the traditional process of signing up to be in Mukana in our communication system on the back end, I would highly encourage you to do it. Not only will you have extra access to being able to ask and vote on questions during the show every day, but you also get uh, to be part of kind of a a robust community during the show every day that talks about what we're talking about, that has a discussion of the questions as they go through. It's really a nice place to hang out. You know, it's one of the great entries into the Office Hours community. Uh, it's the top of the hour. We'll be right back. We're very excited today to host John Barker and Lucas Herman, uh, two of the people who are behind our topic today. They've been old friends of the shows. They've been here for a long time, and they are talking today about run of show. For those of you who might not be in the live production industry, the run of show is typically a document, but also a system that keeps everything happening at the right time and the right place. It provides kind of a, a stream for cues and makes sure that what you're doing in your show happens to the expectations of everybody through the whole process. It is the heart and soul of live production done on a professional and public facing uh, method. And so John and Lucas have been working on this. John, we're very excited to have you back. Welcome back to the show. I know it's been a while since I've been on Office Hours. I was just chatting with uh, Josh in our sort of pre-show checks, and it was two years to the week that I was here talking about H2R graphics. Uh, time has flown uh, by so fast. It's crazy. It has. We've missed you. We've missed you. And Lucas, uh, welcome. I was check your audio and make sure that you're in well. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I, I hope uh, I can contribute today also, working together with John on this tool. We're absolutely excited for this. And John, I'm just going to toss it to you to give us an idea. Tell us what your new product does and how it fits into what we talk about here in Office Hours. All right, good first question. So as you said, it's me and Lucas here today talking about Rundown Studio, our new project we've been working on for less than a year now. Uh, and there's another guy involved, Spike, who couldn't be here today for two good reasons, I think. One, he's in Australia, so the time zone is not in his favor right now. And number two, he just had his first child like two weeks ago. So double reasons. He's probably ah, awake though, wouldn't be surprised. Spike. Yeah, I'll pass that on. Um, but yeah, so the, the whole idea for us and something I've been thinking about building for years now, to be honest, is a way of just getting productions on time, trying to get everyone on that same page. We've all been to all sorts of shows where you get like printed PDFs handed to you, which are instantly out of date. And uh, maybe you get a link to a random Excel that you can download, which is also instantly out of date. Or maybe you get a Google Sheet sometimes, which, you know, can be kept up to date, but uh, it's not really built for the purpose. So there's there's uh, there's things that we thought we could add to that. Um, and that's the whole idea between behind Rundown Studio, where not just myself, but myself and Lucas and Spike can come together, me being sort of a, a go-between between, between the production side of, of the world and also development side. Lucas, who's, I don't think I would trust him to start a camera, never mind uh, run a whole production, but he's an amazing developer. So having him on the team is, uh, is huge. And then Spike, I wouldn't trust him to uh, run a website, but he's absolutely great at productions and running products and all those sorts of things. So I think the three of us together are actually coming at it from slightly different angles. But um, the sum of that is hopefully a great product already within a year, and then something that's going to get even better. And I think a show like this with an audience like officers is the perfect place to show what we have, or maybe even um, ask 
what people really want to see because that's what we want to build is like the the best, easiest, fastest tool to get in and out of with data, run a show and not have to even think about it. Um, so that's kind I'm going to ask you in at. just a second to talk us through what a run a show is for anybody who hasn't been involved. But first, I want to talk to Lucas for just a second because you did show t- uh, stagetimer.io, which I think a lot of people use. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you got into that and why and what the feedback has been? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I started working on that uh, three years ago. And as John already said, I'm I'm a developer first. So I'm coming from kind of from the software development side into this um, video production, live video production world. Um, and I have seen this problem with a friend who, who has a studio, he was doing his recordings, and he has like kind of had to run around to, to click on timers just to start them and then uh, get back to his uh, live mixer. And thought, you know, as a software developer, like this can be done in the cloud. Like I can code this in a weekend, which I did. Um, and since then, we have gotten uh, a- incredible feedback from from this community about what we can improve, what features are needed, like how they are using Stage Timer in in various ways, um, and have been coding on it for three years now. And um, at the same time, I have been knowing John, and he always wanted to build this uh, rundown tool. And um, so, so we united working on it together because I'm kind of translating a lot of knowledge I learned from from the stage timer experience into this rundown studio. Even though it's not yet you know as as feature rich um, as stage timer is, but it it definitely um, ha- like avoided a lot of the pitfalls that I that I coded into my other tool. And John, tell us, just take us very briefly for people who might not be familiar with this, kind of what is a, what happens in the back in comms and things like that for somebody calling a show using a tool like this? So typically what I have found um, for a tool like this is, is really like a, a source of truth, a, a document, whether that be printed or cloud-based like our solution, a place where all the team can look and say, this is the most up-to-date information that I have. Here is what's coming throughout a show, whether it's a 10 minute show or a a two day show, what time people need to be in certain places, what cues certain departments have. Maybe the audio team needs to know what mics to put on the guests. Uh, Maybe the GFX team needs to know what, when and and where to show lower thirds. So it really becomes that one place where the whole team should look and see what's coming up, what's currently active. How much time do we have left and how long is the next queue? So it becomes like a, a destination for information, but not not just that. And where I think a specific tool really comes in handy is a timing based tool where you know how long something's going to be and you know how much time you have to, you know, grab a microphone and run across the stage and, and put it on somebody. So that's kind of where I've come from in terms of the run of show tools. Nice. Very nice. Um, so talk to me about the development process. When did you think about this? And what are some of the top features that you heard that people wanted that you felt weren't addressed by the other products that are like this? Well, like I said, I have been thinking about building a tool like this for a long time. and um, But it, it's really come a long way since maybe February, March last year. And a lot of that momentum at the time was working with a few different people and getting into shows where I did actually need to use show running tools. Previous to that, like I've talked about in the past here on Office Hours, you know, maybe I'm going to a conference by myself and recording all the camera angles and you don't really need to necessarily get into that if you're a one person team. Um, but I've been working on a, in a studio quite, no, quite close to me recently where um, a really good show runner comes in and, and, uh, and uses tools like Rundown Studio to to run through their entire live production. So as always with HDR graphics, with HDR gear, my previous um, development projects, you know, I need the tool, I want the tool, I see the alternatives and I feel that I can um, give it a, a crack at having a, a good take on on an alternative. So that's why we, we decided to go cloud-based for this one, which is something I really got used to with the HDR gear, everything being in the cloud, and um, something I find time and time again with uh, with running shows and typically using things like Stage Timer to do it. But we wanted to make something that was a bit more dedicated towards show run of shows, um, but completely cloud-based. And I think for me, talking to people, that's one of the main things I heard is you know, when you print something out, it's it's gone in terms of accuracy. So that that 
getting that all working and uh, getting team members involved and uh, building those features as a core was really where we started. I, I think we need to take a look at it. I understand you have a demo set up for us so we can actually see what this thing looks like. Let's do it. Um, yeah, we we came in with a fair warning as well that my internet, I'm back on my 4G internet again. So if things fall apart, Lucas is hopefully going to, you know, take over for me, but we'll, we'll hopefully get there um, with a, a nice demo. So I do, I have my screen shared into your system. So I'm hoping that all works and, and looks just fine, which I, I can see. That yeah, it it's up on program now. Excellent. So Rundown Studio, I'm logged into the site and you, you can head over to rundownstudio.app. I think there's a link in I'm sure you'll find a link near this video somewhere or um, just uh, let me know if you can't find it. But you can sign up for an account. One of my biggest things is getting people into tools. I love to give people a f like free access to tools, give them a bunch of features that they can use before having to um, go into any paid plan. So you can already play with your sh yourself and uh, don't feel free to, to jump in and do that. Um, so I'm in my account here and I have all my rundowns listed. And I'm actually just going to launch right in and take a look at one I've just been playing with a little before this live stream uh, today. So what I really wanted to do is just show how things look in terms of um, of the tool. But what we found time and time again is it's really about getting data into the tool. Now, of course, I could go through here and make any changes I want. For example, like this first section of my rundown is... Um, is not an opening and welcome anymore. It's now uh, the CEO will uh, speak for a while. I'm trying to type here while I chat. Um, so all of the data, as you can see here in the cells and in each of these queues is all editable. I could sit and build the show as I um, as I go through. But just to take a step back for a second, one thing we really wanted to do is get data into the tool as easy as possible. and um, we know that people love using other tools like Google Sheets and uh, many other ones out there. So what we have built is I have a, a real example rundown here in my uh, in Google Sheets format. And if I just file download that as a CSV, I can in Rundown Studio jump in to my main area here and actually upload that as a CSV file. And with a little bit of, as you can see here, um, magic alongside OpenAI, what we do with that CSV is take a look through the data that you've provided. In fact, I will just um, do that because it does take a, a few seconds. So this is the CSV that I downloaded just before the, the show there and let that upload. And we take that into our system, look through it. And of course, everyone gives you know start times, durations, end times, everything. They give different names in their own system. Like it, it's... We asked when people signed up for our tool in the early days, we asked them to send us sample rundowns and not a single one looked like the one that was sent previous. Like every single one has its own way. And I don't just mean they used a slightly different border or a slightly different color. Like every title you could imagine was used in there. Um, so Lucas, the, my, my development skills hit a certain um, limit for sure. But that's whenever Lucas kicked in and said, you know what, I think with the playing with uh, ChatGPT, OpenAI that I've been doing, I can do something funky here. In fact, Lucas, um, yeah, tell me a bit about what you did in the tool uh, to make it even better. Yeah, so uh, one, one thing, like in it, when I build stage time, I already wanted to have a tool that kind of imports everybody's CSV file without problems, right? And I didn't want to say your your Excel sheet, your your Google Docs has to look exactly like this, and otherwise it doesn't work. I wanted to make it flexible, um, but I found that that people have an incredibly variety of 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 things that they use as their rundowns. So what we decided to do with the the emergence of of AI and and ChatGPT, I thought, why not kind of put this into the AI? And see if the AI can just like understand this document and return to us some kind of outline, some kind of um, like this is, you know, this is the start time and he here's the durations and here's the, the kind of section headings and here's is, is the content. And from this information, basically being able to import any, um, yeah, any rundown people built 
more or less without problems. I mean, right now it's still very early days and, and not, not, not all of them will work right out of the bed. But we are kind of learning from all these um, errors that, that are being thrown and trying to improve this importer. So you literally can just take any um, sheet you created for your rundown, import it into Rundown Studio, and it should look halfway decent. And you can use it as a starting point to work with it. So even if you're working in an Excel now to do it, or if you're working in some sort of text with tabs and, you know, you said commas, delimited, tab, delimited, whatever, it's got some intelligence behind there to parse that and at least give you a running start in your actual run of show in the prog in the, in the software. Is that what I'm understanding? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, exactly. great. And if John? I am back in my demo here, um, so I got an email Actually, a lot faster than, uh, you know, how live demos go. You always think it's going to take forever. So I did get an email into my account um, telling me that the import was successful, which is great. Thank you. Thank you, demo. And this is the one I just dropped in. Uh, you, you'll have to believe me, but I promise you. This is the one I just imported into the tool. It went through the whole system, checked it out. Uh, what you can see here is it actually, um, if I go back to the example CSV, there are no real sections here or anything. These are just point by point, um, you know, cues, so to speak. And in this section, though, it has actually, or in sorry, in the Rundown Studio, in the import process, it's actually did its best to sort of group things into sections and uh, headings, as we call it, so that you can clearly define, you know, what what's going to happen throughout the day. Now, obviously, we've we've kind of taken a our best guess on how that can work, and we find that other rundowns really do a good job of showing sections and we can easily do a, a much better job of this kind of stuff. But you get a, a get a good taste of how it will actually work. You can also see here that it has added in all of the time. So the, the run rundown starts at nine o'clock and the first one is at 10 minutes duration. And then we have 20 minutes and 15. So all those timings are added in there. Um, it's added all the columns as well. So like the host and guest location, things that you would typically add to your um, sort of departments, you know, the GFX department or the VTs that are running, they've all found their way into the right columns. So it's really nice. I can only imagine, it does take time. I, I personally built a bunch of rundowns in Rundown Studio. Um, another reason why we asked for rundowns in the early days was so that we could just try the tool ourselves and see where it, you know, where it fails, where it wins. So using those rundowns in the early days, I did build a bunch in Rundown Studio. And it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't take a ton of time, but if you can get yourself ahead instantly like this, then it really makes sense. And it only took like 20, 30 seconds to import that one, which is really nice. Yeah, um, let me just, I am going to... Oh, go ahead. Let, go ahead, Lucas. Let me add one detail here. So when you when you look at the rundown that John just imported, you see a lot of like red and green highlighting of cues. Now, um, his rundown is very short. I kind of instructed the AI to kind of highlight important things in different ways. Because this rundown is so short, it highlighted everything, which is a bad example. <laughs> but if, with a longer rundown, like of a real kind of complex show, it, it works pretty decently. Nice, nice. Um, talk to me a little bit about who can change what. Is is it possible to eliminate who, a limit who has editing access to a rundown for a formal show? Great question. It was actually the next thing to talk about. So uh, it's like we synced this up, Bill. Um, <laughs> I was so, just guessing. <laughs> good guess. Uh, no. So the idea really is it's we built the whole system to be like a team-based system by default. So in my team, <clears throat> excuse me, there's nobody else in there right now. I'm lonely in my team. But if I add anyone to my rundown studio team, then they have access to my rundowns and they can edit all the parts of my rundowns as um, as as usual, just like I'm editing everything in here right now. But if back in my demo, I can be more specific. And this is where, this is where it gets really important. The um, sharing specific things to specific people, which is something, going back to your earlier question, something that, that's been asked for a lot, actually, and something I really wanted. So here, I just opened up the share and export um, settings at the, at the top right there. And this is where I will decide who can edit and view my rundown. In fact, let me just start the rundown real quick just so i have something to show when i get in there um i'll go to the easiest one first pdf export something i really wanted to have in there is a way of getting the data back out of rundown studio you know you sometimes have to go in the middle of a field somewhere or somebody really does like a printed version it happened to me two weeks ago on a show 
as much as they like the tool. They really just wanted something to write on, which is perfectly fine. So you can export a PDF version of that rundown as you see it um, just there. And we can take a look at that later. Uh, then opening up to the, the actual live data a bit more, we have our output area. Now, in my view, I typically think of these as, you know, downstage monitor views or multi-view views, not easy to say, um, where if I open one here, so I have this first layout selected. And if I open that up in incognito where I'm not logged into my account, you'll see that I have full access to the data without any ability to make changes, um, which is which is perfect for someone on the team that you just want to send it to, but you don't necessarily uh, trust, maybe. Or maybe you just don't think that they should be able to mess around with your data. So that's the everything view, I, I'm going to call it for now, where all of the data is displayed slightly differently, perfect for a big screen that goes up in, in, the, um, in your area there. And then... Going to the more typical rundown view that we showed off a few minutes ago, we have a couple of options actually to explore here. Um, what we can do is hide certain columns from certain people. So if you, for example, the audio department don't really need to know whenever GFX are shown, maybe they don't need to know about VTs just for the sake of um, discussion here. Um, we can hide those columns from that department. And of course they want to see the audio. And in fact, what we can do is say like the audio department really should be able to edit the audio column as well. Oh, that makes sense. So that the particular people in charge of an area have some access to updating in real time as the show progresses. Precisely. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat is a mess today, so I'm, I'm going to keep going. Um, yeah, that's the idea. And maybe you don't even need to add them as, to your team because you just want them to edit for the next you know 20 minutes going through the whole team adding process, it's there's no time for it. You just want to get them in there. So I've added that now. I've removed some stuff from them and I've made their editable column the audio column. So if I copy that and open that up incognito as well, what you'll see is the rundown loads in. And now I have the same rundown, which is actually in running mode because we are running the whole show and we're two minutes over right now. They have their <laughs> columns, <laughs> columns that are showing here. Um, where the hidden ones are are hidden and they also have access to one of the columns here you can actually see there is that little editable um marker there just to let them know that they can edit this column and they can make changes in there but they can't actually edit any of the other columns which is quite nice so you can decide how restrictive you want to be for certain um certain people and in fact if you want to get people in even faster which is quite nice you can, for example, if I was to hide all these columns except for the first one, we have even easier ways like our quick access code or just a QR code. So you can just scan the QR code, get direct access into this rundown. In fact, the last show I did, or two shows ago, we used Rundown Studio for it. And you know, the, there was just a line by the, um, the show caller. There's just a line of technical people all lined up with their iPads and phones out waiting to scan their QR code. You know, I want to get my QR so I can get access to my uh, view of the runtime, which was quite nice. It's really good That's to see. That's pretty exceptional. You're saying it. that people on iOS devices or, or mobile devices or whatever, uh, all are live linked into this. And as changes are made, are they updated on all of those devices so that everybody gets kind of real time? Because no show exactly. survives the first, you know, 10 minutes without changes. Exactly. That's the idea. Just get everyone in there. They can see all the changes and, of course, see the timers as they run down through the show. In fact, if I just jump ahead, I never really showed show control. But once you start it, we have a nice big timeline showing how much time's left. And then the last five seconds are counted down as well, really clearly and uh, visually for people. And then we go into overtime and uh, the show caller can just keep, you know, jumping through the show or maybe skip ahead if they want to by queuing up a future queue space barring, and then they get to that later. Would that trigger uh, a big queue. flashing get off stage for the uh, monitors for the <laughs> that, talent? That should be a, a pro feature, shouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it should, absolutely. Uh, we got a lot of people who want questions in here. Alex, take in. Yeah, this looks great. Um, d is there any support for um, uh, teleprompt, you know, as far as text and so on and so forth, and some of the other rundown creators? Is that something you're thinking about? It's certainly something we have talked about and thought about um we haven't really got that just yet right now all we have is like a you know downstage monitor that you could put on a prompter but yeah, not yeah. with like scripting on there um what we 
we're keen to do in this early phase is like build the best editor that we can build and then consider it's really what nice. features it's really nice and it clean. should be. Yeah. What, what I really like is the clean interface of, of what, what you have there. It's really easy to look at. <laughs> it's really easy to share. When you send it out to other people, in addition to being able to turn columns off, are you able to rearrange them at all? Or is it just, it's just they're in the order that they're in and you just simply turn the ones off that you need to turn off? Um, you as the creator of the rundown or a full editor of the rundown can decide the order of the columns. But for right now, an edit, uh, a viewer will see them in the order that yeah. they have been predefined. Uh, something we have, I have thought about in the early days, but uh, the, the, again, the reason for that would be something. Good. The, the reason that, that we like the audio department is a good example. Like the audio department may want their cues to be in the front, but they still want to see the other columns. But they want to maybe have them in a different order than they than they were in the other ones. Um, but uh, yeah, overall, it looks it looks really great, really great work. Chris Fenwick, did you have some yeah. thoughts? Definitely. I was going to say the same thing, especially about the audio, John, and uh, both you guys. It's very cool. I will tell you, John, this is something that I've been mulling over in my head for 30 years. Okay. So you're like a hundred times smarter than me to actually get it done. Like literally decades I've been wanting this. Um, do you have the ability? So let's say I am the audio guy, right? And all of a sudden I'm panicking and I'm like, oh, I got to make sure that in 30 minutes I have the right thing, you know, whatever. So I scroll ahead. Let, let's let's put put ourselves in this guy's. I scroll ahead to you know item twenty seven. I need I need the ability to you know I would call it a scribble strip. I might want to just draw, like circle something, like big go 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 checkbox checkbox. I would love it if I could do that. I mean, yes, editable. Hey, don't don't worry, you know, don't forget to turn this one up a little bit. No, I just want a big red arrow. Yes, I want to be able to change the order of the columns, but now I'm lost. Where are we in the show? Is there a quick way that I can just hit a home button and it takes me back to what we're currently on and or where the show caller is, is basically cued to? Uh, not right now. Good question, though. Um, so, good feature request, I should say. But it's a great uh, feature request because it's one of the ones that I wanted to do thirty years ago. Um, I, I want to make sure you understand. I love what you're doing. I'm just feature requesting things that I've thought about for a long time. And Lucas, I saw you like wince when I said I want to draw on the screen. It's like, oh, oh come on, <laughs> let be, come on, be cool, dude. <laughs> but I'm, uh, the question, but, can, but can that's you print why out people like. Scribbles? <laughs> well, but that's why people do like paper. Obviously, they we want to get people off of paper, but that kind of functionality to be able to highlight something as like, hey, I missed this cue in rehearsal. Don't miss it this time around. Understood. CJ, do you have a quick thought before we get back into John's demo? Yes. Uh, so with the rapid pace of advancements in the AI space, how often do you guys find the need to import, uh, like update that core import functionality? Like when when OpenAI has a major feature improvement, are you guys running into your development meeting to say, you know, how quickly can I translate this to a user experience, or do their, or how much do their changes impact you really? Yeah, I, I can take this. that one. Um, we we literally just built the import like a few days ago. So it's it's on the newest version, but yeah, of course, as as time goes on, I mean, OpenAI they they just added the option to to have like functions execute um, as part of your AI um, a prompt or AI output. So you're probably gonna use that in the future in the future instead of the kind of more clunky uh, method we are doing now to get information out. Um, yeah, definitely, it, it, it's it's a growing and evolving thing. John, you want to dive back in, and and what else haven't we seen that you're exceptionally proud of? Yes, absolutely. Um, let me see where was I in the whole show. Yeah, so uh, I think Chris mentioned a little bit there about like making notes. So I didn't really show off at least a way of personalizing it uh, within a within a you know queue based level. So for example, here on the audio tab, I just write I just wrote this text in. Nice big green for you, uh, Chris. Um, don't forget, or red, sorry, don't forget this information. So we do have like some formatting options here. So you could build, 
for example, uh, checklists, if you really wanted to, you have a few of those in here. Um, so you can run the, run down what way you do things in a certain order, usually. That's in a pre-show. cool. I love checklists. I love me some checklists. I love me some checklists too. <laughs> and then we have color options. Uh, it's such a weird thing to talk about. Like we have color options, but it's true. Everyone or probably our most requested feature is like, it's totally well, okay. one sense. of many. Yeah. One of many is like, can I have X color added? Uh, which which I think is a compliment that we've gotten so many good features in there that all people are left to ask for in, in certain <laughs> scenarios is like, I also want yellow, which is uh, which is a valid. Uh, <laughs> is that just text? Can you can you add an emoji if you wanted to highlight something for somebody? You're doing a great job of reminding me what I'm actually going to talk about next. I think you can add emojis. Ooh. It's just, it should be. Yeah, there you go. It's just a text awesome. field. But you can also add, I have a weird picture of myself here that I just found right before we went live. You can add imagery by dragging and dropping it into the cell as well. So you How could, cool. for example, in the host column, this is really great for like, what 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 do hosts even look like? I'm not sure. Or what do the guests look like? You can drop imagery into there. Maybe the GFX team needs to know like what lower third they should be showing so you can throw those things in there in fact if i make the column a bit wider you can really see that quite clearly so that's outstanding because nobody stuff. in in this business is visual right <laughs> <laughs> never <laughs> it's ever. only the reason we're in it so, exactly <laughs> uh, john one one last thing do when you're um so let's say let's go back to the audio guy uh i make a note because you've given me editability of that column those notes are viewed by everybody? Correct. The way we have set it up right now is it's yeah. one place for the whole team. So the audio column is the audio column for the show. And therefore, you get access to that if I give you access to that. And you can edit that if uh, I give you editable access. So you would be adding your own details in there. And we could all see um, what so you've if, written in there. So if you had a column that was like scribbles, that those should be for me only like th this is just something for me mm -hmm. you know it be, because if you think about it let's say i do add a checklist now all of a sudden a producer or a director is scrolling through and all of a sudden he sees something that looks different on the page that can be really disruptive and i don't mm -hmm. need to see that i didn't mean to screw your screen up because a lot of people uh, i know what I, I i can only talk about myself I know that when I'm looking at something, I register where something was on the screen or page. Like when I'm here, if I jump to there, I know there's something important. If you add two lines of something and I jump down there and it's not there, I'm panicking. Mainly, I don't read really well. So I'm really, I need to see something on a spot on the screen. So if somebody changes where it's going to look, uh, but those scribble notes, that scribble column, that should be uh, user specific. This is just a no for me. Don't be a blank, blank, bad word, bad word. Make sure you don't <laughs> screw up this flipping cue. I don't want to offend everybody on the crew, although there might be some people I do want to offend. Not that you've ever story. actually written that, Chris, right? <laughs> <laughs> we have tons of questions that are piling in here. So, uh, Unless there's something, John, is there anything on your list of must-says that you want to touch on before we go into questions? Uh, I would tell you to tell me, Bill. You have all the my maybe list somewhere on your maybe trying to control the the PDF export quickly. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Someone's helping me today. Um, so back in my demo here, I did download this PDF export earlier, and I downloaded it in. Um, we can do landscape or portrait a portrait we, we found is really good for like loads of columns you know 10 plus columns but in this example here i have this landscape one um and what we've done is just basically remove a lot of the uh the the web feel of it you know and just take it back to like something that is actually printable uh so you can just get all that detail out of there it shows all the start and end times and we have a time zone picker too so you can in theory just you know generate a version for someone else across the world and then give them that version and uh and all the times will be in their local time zone so we have like the time of day start duration and then time of day end. that is super is, uh, cool we have to deal with nice. that in office hours so much because we have a global audience that the fact that you're doing timeline or time zone calculations is awesome 
All right. I think uh, let's get to the questions. CJ, what do we got? Coming in from Poland, it's Robert Sababity. Please provide one simple and one complex example of using the API in Rundown Studio to trigger an event and have something trigger an action in Rundown Studio other than Companion. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. I was, I've been thinking about this this whole time as a good example to give you. So the, my reason for being... Uh, for not having a good answer just yet is because our API right now, we're calling it version zero. And the idea there is like, we have a start, we have a stop, we have a next call in our API because we know that people want to use it with Companion. Uh, we don't even have a Companion module yet. I'm still working on that. So this this version zero, I wouldn't say yet that we have a a good basis for examples on you know uh, a simple and a complex API anything outside of the companion world. Uh, maybe if you hold tight and we get version one out, which we were working on actually last week, and the companion module two, then I might have a better answer for you. Um, yeah, I think that's about all. Alex, you yeah, want maybe to comment? The only, thing, the only thing I'll add is that, is that, that as someone who's, I've worked on some event software too, and the number one request we get is, how do I integrate this with companion? <laughs> so, so if you're going to pick one thing you're going to integrate it with, uh, being able to, for, for when you're dealing with event, um, software. This is the thing. If you're going to have your API do something, integrating with Companion is the most important. There you go. Next question. Uh, John Foltz from Sealand Grove, Pennsylvania. Can you demo the setup from Companion to Rundown Studio? John? Which is what we just uh, talked about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't think this is going to be a complete deep dive into Companion uh, right now, but I can show on my share screen share here that I have it set up right now for the version zero of the API. And what I have done is added um, a new instance inside of Companion. And that instance is a HTTP generic request one. That's because we are still working on the module, but it's coming along nicely. I think it's going to be great. Um, and in there, I have added this uh, base URL, which you can grab on our documentation. We have that listed on the website, which is basically the website itself talking specifically to the API, and then specifically updating a rundown, and then my rundown ID, which um, I believe is the one that I was using to show uh, the demo. Yes, it was good. So that's that rundown API, or sorry, rundown ID I've just stolen from the URL bar. And then over in my buttons, I have a second page here with my next button set up. And what I have is added like this little next URI followed by the token, which I've taken from the website. This is just a, a way of making sure that the API request coming in is coming from who you want it to come from in case somebody gets access to your rundown and not, starts messing with your show. We never want that. So I have my secret little token listed on the side there. And in theory, if I next through my show, um, you can see there in the background that my... Rundown itself is actually jumping to the next queue. So like I said before, we only have start, stop, and next in the very early days of the API, but it is working nicely. Thank you once again for the demo working nicely. Good to see you. Lucas, did you have a thought? Yeah, yeah. So this, also in the answer to the previous question, there's if you think about an API, technically there's three levels. There's trigger and action which is what we have implemented right now. It's the easiest level is just, you know, do a command, it triggers an action like going to the next queue. But then the next level is kind of get information out of it. And then the third level is to manipulate data. Um, and we are working right now on the kind of get information out of it. So your your companion module will show like what is your current queue that you're on? What is the time that is counting down? And then the third level, and this is actually something I just re re released with um, stage time on myself, is the kind of level where you can actually go in and edit a queue, add a queue, rem uh, rem remove one, change the text that is written in one of these uh, fields. And this will really enable like far beyond just using it with companion, using it with, with a whole other setup that almost remote controls uh, Rundown Studio or the other way around. Nice. Let's get to the next question. Carl L. Markser from New York. How is Rundown Studio different than ENPS, iNews, or Octopus? Can it send time commands to a stream deck? John? 
having not used those but only really researched them, I might not give you the 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 ultimate answer. But what I've found from speaking to a couple of people who have used iNews in the past, I believe um those are really built for journalists building a news type show. And a lot of their features that I've seen added to the tools are really to facilitate that sort of workflow. We have, I would say, taken so far a different approach where we're quite interested in building something that's more for like a live streaming market, certainly for, uh, could be used for events and live production all around the board. And I guess it could be used for news as well, but it's certainly not something we've headed in that direction. Going back to Alex's uh, question earlier about teleprompters and scripts and even automation, things that are outside of what we've currently tried to tackle. I don't think that the two are quite in the same market right now. And therefore, um, and to the second part of the question, they're sending time commands to, to Stream Deck. Not currently, going back to the API question before as well, it's still early days for us. So we're not really speaking to many other tools just yet. Um, we're kind of laying the groundwork of what the the next big set of features will be for the tool. So stay tuned. Next question. John Foltz from Sealands Grove, Pennsylvania. Would it be possible to display NDI sources in Rundown Studio? John? Not currently. Um, and perhaps not really ever that easily, at least. Um, our idea for the tool is cloud-based all the way. Uh, so running it, it, we've we've tried integrating NDI with things like Dashmaster 2K, which I see a question coming up on that. And it does take a few hops to get that to work well. And we're not quite interested in, you know, holding a service ourselves that lets NDI work on this tool online across the cloud. So I don't see that being a direct addition but if in our output, we might have a way of showing a video source and you can find a way of getting that NDI into uh, the protocol that we end up putting in there, maybe that's possible. Next question. Guy Cochran from Seattle. Could you give a quick example of how you would utilize your other software, such as Dash Master 2K with Rundown in a production? Ah, interesting question. Who would have thought of that, John? <laughs> yeah, Dash Master 2K is something that uh, Lucas and I built just for fun, really, uh, we just we just wanted to like sink our teeth into an interesting project. If you're not familiar, which um, you, which you may not be, it's a way of building dashboards for just about anything. But really, it is focused on the stuff that we care about, the live video production stuff. In fact, over on the on the screen share here, I'm showing the site. If you haven't played with that before, but the idea is that you can build custom dashboards um, and funny, even though I'm developing it, my own personal uh, uh, paid account expired the other day. So I'm only going to show you the free features, um, but you can build dashboards and uh, and add certain sources. For example, I've added, uh, what did I have there a second ago? Just a little dummy graph so you can look, look interesting to your uh, clients. Uh, this little um, video pattern here, but you can also add just about any iframe, as long as the website lets you do it. And in Rundown Studio, I could share and export the um, the monitor view here. I'm just copying that link, adding that into the URL. Let's see, hopefully this, everything works as I wanted to, as it has so far, has worked well. Um, so I could add that, like you see here, into my Dash Master view. And then now I can open that link up across my network or across the world as well and give people access to several things like the YouTube feed coming in from um, officers, let's say, maybe the timings, maybe um, uh, YouTube uh, links from the chat as well or other things that are handy for people. So it does work nicely already. We don't have a specific module just yet for Rundown Studio, but, um, but it works anyway through the iframe. There you go. Next question. Adrian Watkins in Wellington, New Zealand. Assuming a collaborative client getting real-time updates over cellular, what would the expected data consumption for an hour-long show with 50 cues? Lucas is going to handle this one, Lucas. Yeah, so I can speak to that. The The way we use the, the real-time updates is, is not like many other tools that fire kind of an update every 100 milliseconds, but we do a on-demand thing 
that only changes on an atomic level get get um, propagated. And we haven't made a test with Rundown Studio, but I basically just uh, copied what works from stage time over. And there I know that kind of beyond the page load, which is about two megabytes, you will not go over five megabytes for the entire show um, in data consumptions. And it works in such a way that if your um, cellular network is a bit slow at times, it basically catches up, right? It will, it will get its commands a bit late, but they eventually arrive. And because they uh, contain timestamps, your timer will um, update to the correct time, even if the command arrives a bit late in your computer. So it should it should work pretty reliably, even with spotty and low uh, slow network connections. Nice. John, you wanted to add on? Yeah, that just reminded me of one other thing I didn't show earlier. Uh, back over on my demo here, it's just a subtle, small little thing, but one of the one of the little features, maybe it's not even a feature I would call it, but little additions here is we have a signal strength connection ping that's running um, constantly, basically, on the site. And the idea there is I have used tools in the past where you wander away from the Wi-Fi and then you're updating this cloud-based tool and things get slow or disconnect and you lose data or you just get very confused about if you're connected or not and if your internet's slow, why is certain things happening slower than other people's computers. So we wanted to add that in there just so people have a general reference. Um, I Mine is often not in the green because my 4G is not great sometimes, but um, it gives me a bit of reassurance that the tool is working just fine and I'm sure it's working just fine for other people. It's just the, the connection um, that I am connected to. Maybe I'm on a on the outside of the building or I've wandered away from the internet source and therefore I can be reminded that I should probably look into that so I can get the best possible experience of the tool. Nice. Nice little touch. Next question. David Brady in New York. What's the crack, John? At the onset of the pandemic, we were seriously looking at show flow for functionality like Rundown Studio. Were they an inspiration? Also, what kind of inter-app operability does Rundown Studio have? H2R, GFX, Companion, etc.? John? Yeah, thanks, David. What's the crack? I was just back in Ireland for a few days there, and I heard that term a hundred times. Um, yes, show flow, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say inspiration because it's certainly something I've been thinking about long before I had used or heard of show flow. Um, I think that we are sort of taking a different approach to it than show flow. And certainly people I've talked to who have used show flow, uh, personally, I've used it one time before, but mostly just talk to people who have used it. Um, I think that what we're aiming at here is taking a, what I would consider a more focused approach on making it as easy to get data in and out as possible. And I think we've come a long way in the early days. And, uh, and we're, we're really keen on, on keeping that up where we can get people's feedback fast. I mean, I've been taking notes throughout this whole chat here with thoughts that people have already and keep on building it to be like the, the the best possible tool that we can make to make the shows easy. Um, the second part of the question, we don't really have a, a good set of integrations just yet because we really want to build that second version of the API, like Lucas uh, spec'd it earlier. I, I can see a day absolutely where you know something happens in GFX or H2R graphics that um, that tells Rundown Studio to do something, or maybe the other way around. Of course, we want to make that happen. Since we both know our own tools so well, Lucas and I with Stage Timer and with H2R graphics, we, we don't see a reason not to push towards that at some point. We're just trying to, you know, trying to push that back a bit further so we can keep adding all of the tool features that we really want to add into Rundown Studio for now. Alex, you had another question. And Showflow is now owned by CBEN, right? Yeah. I, okay. Like, yeah. Because like, it's like, it, it, it's like when you ask now, like you look at the price for Showflow, it's like, contact us. That's, yeah. That's yeah. All, I just want to point that out. That's all. <laughs> Maybe a slight competitive advantage. Well, no, no, no. It's just, it's just, it's just that it, anytime you see contact us, you know that the bill is going to be heavy. Someone you know, needs like, to so, talk, so it's, talk you So through. I think that, I think that, I mean, I think that, um, I guess I would say for people who are talking about whether this compares to Showflow or not, when Showflow got bought by Cvent, it's really good for Showflow. It's probably really good for Cvent. It's probably no longer a product that you're going to use on a daily basis unless you're doing a Cvent 
thing. Like, unless you're, you know, it's part of an ecosystem. It's kind of like when Cisco buys things, they kind of just disappear into Cisco things, you know, like, and, and you know, you no longer think of them as a retail uh, solution. So I would probably say that this is a great opportunity. I think, I think what's great about Rundown Studio is that it it's coming in at the right time. <laughs> so I think you've way. summed up perfectly what several people have told me yeah. over the last few months. Yeah. Yeah. Because as soon as it gets bought by a company like that, you're like, oh, there it goes. <laughs> like, you did know, I so, see, did Lucas, did you have a thought there? Or is, I, I thought I saw some action. No, we'll just go on to the next question then. Douglas Carmichael, the event one time plan is only activated for 10 days. For freelancers, would you ever introduce a conventional per month plan without a time limit? Lucas, start us off or John, either one. Sorry, I was muted right there. Um, yeah. So we basically just took inspiration from other tools um, to name probably in, in this case was Lido and we just looked how, they, how do they do it? What plans do they have? And, and then we kind of copied their ideas here. Um, we actually would love to know from you, like, what do you exactly need? Um, for example, with my own tool, Stage Timer, I just recently moved from a 10-day to a 30-day license, which I thought was, was much more applicable. And we are a bit hesitant to do um, subscription monthly, um, just because from, from a business perspective, I have made like bad experiences with it. Um, subscriptions tend to be hang around, people forget them, people want, you know, they, they want to have a money back or they like kind of bit, get a little bit mad about at your tool that, that they're still subscribed and now they paid for a month that they haven't used. Um, so that, that's what we wanted to avoid really. Um, so this is nothing against the user. Like if, if a, a different plan works better for you, please, by all means, write us and we will um, make sure that we find a solution. John, John, you wanted to weigh in on this? Yeah, I think Lucas is, summed up the the plans really well there i think the only other thing to add is that if you jump onto our marketing page right now the first price that you're uh shown is basically how much it's going to cost you for a year which at first can seem like a big number um but i was really keen and we were all quite keen actually to, to not do the usual marketing uh dark pattern of saying like here's what it costs monthly if you pay yearly so it can at first seem like Okay, yearly is my only option, but we have the event one, and like Lucas said, we're we're interested to hear if people want to be more specific than that. Alex, um, I, I I can say that if, if you're using Slido as the model, the number one reason I don't use Slido is because of the of the pricing. Like so, so the thing is, I look at it, I, I you know, like like I you know, because I you know, I have a I obviously have a product that's like Slido, <laughs> but but it Slido has a lot of features that we don't that we don't do, and we look at it. We have clients that look at it, and. And the thing is, is the per event model, I'm kind of like, well, I don't know, like, I don't know if I would know that by that, in that, that quickly, whether I wanted it or not. And then I have to commit to a year to it. And the Slido model is really expensive. And I just look at it like, hmm, probably not. And so that, you know, so, and I feel like they, you know, they're, they're kind of, again, in a Cisco model where they don't really care anymore. <laughs> you know, so, so the, uh, so the, um, but I, but I, I will say that the number one reason that we haven't implemented Slido in places where I didn't think Makana was necessarily what the client wanted was because of the way that they structured their pricing, you know, and, and if it was $49 a month or 35 bucks a month or whatever, I'd pick it up immediately and just play with it. Um, whereas when I look at the big number, I go, well, like, you know, like, like, I'll, you know, I'll think about that. So I, I get, and, and if I, I have to admit, as someone who subscribes to a lot of things, if I subscribe to something for six months and don't use it, I go, well, that's on me. Like, you know, like I didn't, I didn't, I, didn't, I don't, I, I think that I, I would not spend a lot of time going back and forth with someone who complained about being subscribed for six months and not realizing it. That's kind of on them. Next question. Craig McFarlane from Boston, Massachusetts. How does a role track something that needs to be done 20 minutes before a given item? John? Uh, yeah, we have, um, back over on my demo here, we have added both durations and time of days. So you have a general idea of not only how long something lasts, of course, but how what time of day it will happen at. So if I start uh, if I start this show here and just scroll down a bit, I'm not sure how well it comes across on the, on the live stream, but let me just zoom in a bit. You can see here what each queue will start and end. So this one will start at 11.05. And end at eleven seventeen. Um, so looking ahead on the 
show will will tell you you know what time this interactive poll with q a will start at it'll start at 11 35 and as the show runs and runs over as well we will update these uh, times to say actually now it's going to be 11 35 uh, 50 and so on so we'll keep it we'll keep track of what time queues start and end but we'll also push them as a show runs over like this one just started doing nice next question david brady from new york comes to us via the qr code for the enterprise is the licensing by site or individual are there single sign-on integrations to manage membership by way of active directory etc lucas yeah so to the first question uh, the licensing is by team and it scales with the amount of team members you have um, in it you can have as many sites as many events uh, as you as you desire and about the um, single sign-on single sign-on is when you have other like company accounts that you can use to sign into your tool this is really kind of a business question right does it make sense to implement it is because it is a challenge it is it will take us quite a significant amount of time to get this done um so if if an enterprise deal is big enough to 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 um justify the implementation for sure otherwise it will probably have to wait i would say a good year until we can implement something like this let's go to the next question Yeshua Bell says, is there any consideration for an offline version of Rundown Studio similar to the offline stagetimer.io? Lucas? Yeah, yes, yes, there is. So when um, John and I sketched out how we code the tool, we had a few options and, and thought, okay, what is easier, what is what is more difficult? And we anticipated that people do want to use it in an offline setting. Because you know who trusts internet, especially when their live show depends on it. So from the very beginning, we kind of architected an offline version into the tool. It's not there yet, but it is possible. We haven't yet decided if it's going to be an offline version, kind of like Stage Timer is, or like Companion or Graphics that you just download, download it and, and start it on your computer, or if it's going to be some kind of more on-premise solution where you would have to set up your own server and run it there. Um, but it will it is possible from the architecture and it will come. Next question. Jack Cannon from Phoenix, Arizona. Not watching real time, so apologize if this has been discussed. I see a play in a next option. If you're running a solo show, can it just auto play through the queues without interaction? John? We certainly thought about it and people have definitely asked for it as a feature. Um, not something we've added just yet, but it is on our tracking feature list. I'm always keen to know from people, and feel free to send me a message afterwards, like what, why, why they might want to do that with a tool and have it auto through like that for a rundown tool. I'm always keen to hear their use case so we can keep backing up our, uh, our feature tracker. But it, it's certainly on our list of things to look into. Fair enough. Next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. What future input or output AI features do you see adding to Rundown Studio? Output examples might include the AI making inferences about the show content and the ability to pull the show data. Lucas. Yeah, we really try to avoid making too much inferences. Like we really, I really worked hard to make sure it takes the data one by one. Like it doesn't change the data you put in. It may highlight something. It made inferences about headings and, and sections, but not about the information itself. Um, if we add more in the in the future, so we really don't want to just add AI just to have AI written on the website, as many other tools may may do. I don't know. We, we are not interested in that. What we really want to do is make the tool better. And if AI can help us, we we use it. And if it doesn't, we don't use it. Um, so. Are we going to use it in the future? Yes, if it makes sense. And I mean, I'm I'm working daily with AI myself as a developer, so I'm I would say I'm pretty aware, kind of where AI makes sense and and how to use it in, in an effective way. Great. Next question. Jesse Mills from the San Francisco Bay Area. Can videos, slides, images, etc., be uploaded and shared with the production team? John. As I showed earlier a little bit, images, yes, you can drag those in there. Currently, slides and videos is not something that we will host, but it is something we have thought about. Um, for me, a tool like this, as a single source of truth, 
really makes sense to also be a place where assets are held. I am quite keen on that kind of thing, but that, that is no no small piece of work. So uh, hold tight for that, but but hold tight for a while. I don't know. There's a saying in there somewhere. <laughs> Lucas? Yeah, like just to give a little peek behind the, the curtain, this is really a technical challenge. Like technically it's easy to upload things, but the interface makes it not as easy to make it simple to upload things. So this is the challenge we're working with. It's it's like very high on our list, but it we also know, as John said, it takes a significant amount of time to get right. We're going to go through these next ones pretty quick. Next question. Tommy Shans from St. Paul, Minnesota. Are there export options from Rundown to your spreadsheet of choice? John? Uh, not currently. Just PDF export for now. But if enough people ask for it, we're we're happy to add it because like I said earlier, we want to get data into the tool as fast as possible, but we also understand people want to get data out of the tool. So, um, you know, let us know that you want that, especially over email and we're keeping track of all that stuff. Next question. Craig McFarlane in Boston, Massachusetts. Can you describe your color use approach in UI? Things like to highlight differences, calls to action, colors with specific meanings and accessibility. John? Uh, sure. Yeah. So, well, since we're low on time, I'll I'll just describe it instead of showing it here. But, or we we specifically chose. You'll you'll notice if you play with the tool, there are several places to choose colors: the Q level, the text level, and the background of text level. And we specifically chose colors. We spent a while picking them so that you could see them. Um, they were stacked in a certain way. You could always see them whether you chose whatever color in the background, whatever text color, and whatever uh, highlight a text color. And like I said earlier, people want custom colors so that may crumble a little bit as uh as more people ask for custom colors but, but we have specifically done that in the tool so far um as for call to actions and things um right now we're keeping like the main show controls as like the main call to action but if there's any accessibility things that you find in there that, that don't work or don't work as you expect we're definitely open to hear on on those things as well so just let us know as always next question Dave Troutman from Edmonton, Canada. I really like the flashing boxes at the top. When do they trigger? Can they be set to line item or just total show time? John? Yeah, the flashing boxes are shown for the last five seconds of every single queue. So as you run through a queue, um, I can show on my demo here real quick. As I run through a queue, the last five seconds are flashed one after the other. I'll just jump to this one. Five, four, three, to one, you can see it there, and then they'll flash now that this queue is over time. So it is a line item based flash. Nice. Next question. And Douglas Carmichael says, what specific open AI services are you using? Wouldn't a large language model need a text prompt, not a CSV prompt? Lucas? Yeah, we use a ChatGPT uh, 3.5 Turbo. And it does is, is a language model, but it can parse CSV up to a certain size. So it's not just a, it's just not one prompt that we are using. We are actually using a kind of six step process to get the entire import reliably uh, every time or mostly every time. <laughs> Very nice. John, Lucas, thank you so much for being here and giving us a look at Rundown Studio. This has been fabulous. Uh, I hope as it continues to develop, you come back and let us know more about it. And for those of you who've been watching the show, this is your chance. They've asked for your feedback into how things should work. Dive in with that. Uh, tomorrow, we're talking BitFocus Companion. So if you're interested in that, pop in. Thanks to our producers. Uh, those of you who ask questions, our panelists, the back-end crew, everybody who assembles every single day to do this show. This would not be possible without you. We really appreciate it. Um, we traveled 65,504 miles in the Tlaloc Traversal Tay. It's 105,000 kilometers, more than a 518 billion bananas for scale. We will all be here tomorrow doing the same thing. Thank our guests. Thank the, everybody on the crew, and we'll see you tomorrow. I think it was millions. I don't think it was billions of bananas. That's oh, did I? Bananas. Bananas. <laughs> I, I messed the well, scale I have millions. up. Well, I have billions when you can have millions. So. Well, if, if somebody <laughs> exactly. was listening on Pluto, <laughs> exactly. maybe that was accurate. Exactly. We get that. We get that worked out. John and Lucas, it was so great to have you guys here. So much. Thanks. Yeah. Awesome. Pleasure. It's really, really Great to cool. be back. Yeah, it's, it's uh, 
um, yeah, I'm looking forward to a show where I need a good rundown now. So I, I, I've been, uh, yeah, most of my shows are like, worry about the start and then we'll talk and then we'll close. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it's good. It's good. Very good. Thanks. Not Thanks like rundowns are a dynamic thing that change every 30 okay. seconds. <laughs> Come join us more often. It's good to have you on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's fabulous Absolutely. to see you guys. See you later. Thanks. Bye. So much. All right.